Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our April edition of our Sidewalks to Science webinar series. Today, we are excited to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Wilberg, a Career Catalyst Research grantee, as our presenter. Welcome, Dr. Wilberg. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, including your academic background? Yes, I can. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I was, let's see, how do I advance? Um, Okay, so I was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas, and I've lived in Texas most of my um, life, except for a few trips outside of the state. Um, I went to high school overseas in Japan. I lived there for three years. And then um, when I moved back to the US, I lived for a year in, in Kentucky, um, did my freshman year of college there. And then I came back to Texas where I got my bachelor's and my PhD at Texas A&M and College Station. So I was there for about 10 years. And then briefly lived in Florida after grad school. And then I was recruited to the University of Colorado um, as a postdoctoral fellow. And I've been here since the end of 2009 um, <clears throat> and have been promoted to instructor and now assistant professor. And this is where I am. And I live here with my husband and our son. Uh, did you always know you wanted to be a breast cancer researcher? And if not, what did you want to be? Um, so, no, I didn't always know that I wanted to be a researcher because I didn't really even learn what it was to be a, scien a scientist until I was in college. Um, I, I wanted to be a doctor. I knew I loved science from the time I was in middle school and uh, thought I would go to medical school, but ended up learning um, what it was to do lab research, I think as a sophomore, and never look back. Uh, who keeps you motivated and why did you get into breast cancer research? Um, well, so I got into breast cancer research because of my mom and actually what I'll do here, I have a slide um, to talk about her a little bit. I'm gonna, I'll come back to this slide real quick, but um, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer when I was three years old, and she uh, found her cancer early, and she was lucky and had excellent treatment and was essentially cured and hasn't had to deal with anything, um, any relapse or anything. But one thing I learned from her and from um, all the other women I've known who have had breast cancer is that a woman's battle with cancer doesn't always end when she's cured. And that can be, um, it can be something that these women deal with their entire lives. So that's what keeps me um, focused on breast cancer specifically. Before you get into your presentation, I'm going to ask a few more questions just to get to know you a little bit better before we get into your research. So these are going to be just quick, um, you know, all the important things we want to know about you. You ready? <laughs> all right. Uh, cats or dogs? Oh gosh, depends on the animal. In general, probably dogs. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is something on your bucket list? I want to be a farmer one day. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to have chick <laughs> chickens. Mm hmm. Yes, I live in the city. I can't do it now. I have to wait. Um, do you have a hidden talent? Um, I guess I would say gardening. I'm, I'm obsessed with my garden and it's not so hidden. I, I plaster it all over social media, but um, I'm getting pretty good at growing fruits and vegetables and flowers and everything. <laughs> okay. And the most important question, chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. <laughs> I have a drawer full of chocolate in my office. That's how you get through the days. Um, <laughs> yeah. thank, you. thank you so much for sharing a little bit about yourself. And now um, I'm going to turn it over to you and you can uh, let everybody know a little bit more about your research. Okay, so I'm going to go back a slide real quick and just tell, just tell everybody, um, this is a sort of snapshot of my, my research experience so far. So in graduate school, um, I learned about normal mammary development and how the breast tissue grows and um, acquires the ability to produce milk during lactation, um, which is a very demanding process metabolically. And then when I came to Colorado, I started to learn about breast cancer. And um, in my lab here as a postdoc, I learned how cancer cells actually take up sugar and 
turn it into fat. And that's also a very um, metabolically demanding process. And so all my, my experience sort of shaped my in, independent research interests, which are really focused on how the whole patient's metabolism around the body influences breast cancer. And then on the other side of that, how breast cancer treatments influence um, metabolic disease and changes in metabolism in the patient. So, okay. <clears throat> Some of you may have had breast cancer, may have breast cancer, um, and certainly almost everybody probably knows someone. So you've heard of these clinical breast cancer subtypes, but I wanted to point them out to you because I focus on the estrogen dependent or the estrogen receptor positive subtype, which is the most frequently diagnosed. Um, it's diagnosed in 70% or more of patients, and that's about 150,000 women each year. So this is the type of breast cancer um, that I'm interested in right now. And when we think about this particular subtype, um, we always ask what impacts a woman's risk for breast cancer. And with regards to the estrogen dependent subtype, the first thing that comes to mind is obesity. So we've known obesity is a major public health concern and given um, the rates of childhood obesity, we can predict that it will continue to be something that we need to be aware of and how it influences disease. Um, what you're looking at here is a map of the U.S. with each state color-coded by the percentage of adults that are considered obese. I happen to live in Colorado right now, which is one of the lower um, states with the lower prevalence of obesity, but it's still um, <clears throat> one in four people. So overweight, or overall, uh, two out of three adults are considered overweight or obese. And one thing that's important for my research is that the prevalence of obesity is increasing in women, where about, so about 40% of women in the U.S. are considered obese and only 35% of men. And when you're studying something like breast cancer, which overwhelmingly affects women, not exclusively, but the majority of patients are women, um, this is something that we need to be aware of. Um, obesity is linked to lots of different cancers um, all over the body. And Oops. The one that I'm particularly interested in is postmenopausal breast cancer. Uh, so it's estimated that over 70,000 of new cases of cancer in women can be attributed to obesity. And worldwide, the United States has the highest fraction of obesity associated postmenopausal breast cancer. So this is a very big problem, and we're doing a good job to start focusing on it, I think. So specifically, um, my research is focused on what I call a vicious cycle surrounding obesity and breast cancer. And this is a diagram that I drew to sort of summarize what we know about cancer. And that is that obesity, and I have here diabetes. So obesity and diabetes often occur together, but not always. Um, but both obesity and diabetes are risk factors for breast cancer. And as I mentioned a minute ago, my interest is in the estrogen receptor positive subtype, which is the most common. And so the type of therapy that women get for those cancers are what we call endocrine therapy. And they're really aimed at disrupting estrogen signaling. And so they're very effective, but those endocrine therapies have the side effect of actually interfering with metabolism and can make obesity and diabetes worse. So eventually at some point, there's something that happens in the condition of obesity where the cycle, the tumor um, acquires the ability to grow despite the therapy. So the first part of my Komen funded research is to study that aspect of the relationship. How does obesity impact the response to cancer therapy? Um, we know from large population studies that obesity and diabetes both make treatments less effective, and they also increase the risk of death from breast cancer. So not just the risk of being diagnosed, but the risk of relapse. <clears throat> so one of the things that I get asked a lot is, um, what is it about obesity that's so bad for cancer? Um, we, you know, everyone who's considered obese does not get cancer, and and people who are not considered obese, who are lean or normal weight, do get cancer. So what is it that's, that's the problem? And again, large population studies are coming out now that are suggesting two important things that I'm studying specifically in my research program that are linked to breast cancer risk and prognosis. The first is weight gain. So not just being obese, but gaining excess weight, growing your, your fat tissue. And the other thing is um, metabolic function. And what that refers to is basically how sensitive you are to insulin and how quickly you clear sugar from your blood after a meal, for example. And the faster you do that and the more efficiently you do that, the better your metabolic function is. 
So some statistics that I think are really alarming and interesting are that, for example, every five kilograms, which is about 11 pounds of weight gained as an adult, equals about a 10% greater risk for breast cancer. Um, and going from, so with regards to, we've all heard BMI, right? We know about normal BMI, overweight, obese. Going from a normal BMI to obese is associated with a twofold increased risk for breast cancer. And that, the interesting thing about that study is that they showed that this risk, so this going from normal to obese, was actually greater than what was seen for adults who were overweight or obese in their young years, younger adult years, and didn't gain weight throughout their lifetime. And I've tried to illustrate that here in this chart. Um, even though maybe um, as older adults, these two populations of people were close to the same BMI, the higher risk was seen in those that had actually gained weight over their life. So that's something that we need to pay attention to. And then finally, studies have sh shown that regardless of body weight, women who are considered metabolically unhealthy um, have a twofold increased risk for breast cancer. So how common is helping? What we do know, like I just said, um, obesity is linked to breast cancer risk and relapse, and it could be due to weight gain or underlying metabolic disease, such as insulin resistance or prediabetes. And these are things we really need to start separating out and studying. Um, because we don't know how these factors influence breast cancer. So part of my project that I've, my grant was just funded recently, and so part of the project is um, I've developed what, what we call a preclinical model. So that's, that's like a step before a clinical trial. Um, and in this preclinical model, I can study how obesity impacts weight gain and metabolic disease, and then how um, the tumors in the context of obesity respond to therapy. And I can also use this model to look at how therapy affects metabolism around the body. And so just to give you my model, I call it the DIOX model, it stands for diet induced obesity xenograft. So when I give my mice a diet that's high fat and high sugar, um, it causes obesity. And you can see we can measure their body fat using non-invasive imaging the way that we would um, in patients, for example. And then the xenograft part of it uh, refers to transplant of actual tissues from patients here at the University of Colorado um, who consent to donate their tumor. So doctors and nurses and um, scientists and technicians all work together and the doctor takes what he or she needs for diagnostic purposes from the tumor. And then if there's anything left over, a small portion can actually be transplanted and grown in, in lean and obese mice to study sort of how the tumor responds to the environment. So that's the first part of my research. The other side of the, of the cycle, I guess, is looking at how the therapies that we give for cancer actually affect the whole body and the environment. So um, basically asking, how does cancer therapy impact a patient's metabolism? Um, we know, again, from large studies that some types of therapy can cause liver disease in patients, and other um, certain types of therapy actually increase the risk for type 2 diabetes. And I think that this is known, um, but I feel like it's really important to study because it seems really sad for somebody to conquer breast cancer only to be diagnosed with diabetes and have to deal with that later. So I think... Um, that this is a really important area to focus on. So just a reminder of the subtype of breast cancer, the estrogen receptor positive subtype, the primary therapies that are used would be something like tamoxifen. Many of you have heard of that. And what that does is actually blocks the estrogen receptor in the tumor itself. And it's typically given to women prior to menopause. And another class of drugs is called aromatase inhibitors, and those block estrogen production around the body. And those are typically given to postmenopausal women. And it's important for everybody to understand that these therapies are incredibly effective at treating breast cancer and we need to keep using them. But what I think we need to be good at is um, understanding what the side effects are, um, who is at risk for those side effects and sort of how to manage and ideally prevent the side effects. So that's what's next. Basically use my model to understand how obesity and breast cancer are linked on both, you know, on all sides of the cycle. And once we figure out some of those things, we can hopefully identify new targets that we can use to maybe give more options for treatment. And ideally, like I said, um, <clears throat> we can study how certain interventions may be able to prevent some of the negative effects of treatment. And that could be um, something like exercise. We're actually starting an exercise study in a couple of weeks with this model. Um, 
special dietary guidelines that are maybe designed to prevent weight gain during a specific period. And we can even um, look at drugs that may improve metabolism when they're given with these breast cancer therapies. And all of this is, is going on because of funding from the Komen and my fantastic career development team, my mentors and colleagues. And I'll be happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Wahlberg. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask uh, Dr. Wahlberg, we have a chat window that's open that you're more than welcome to enter questions in, and we also have a Q&A box. Um, so please use either of those. Um, we do have a question. Um, so what if um, I've already gained weight as an adult? Um, right. And most of us have, right? Like, <laughs> um, I think it's pretty common to have people that what gain weight and stay at a higher weight or certainly that weight that cycle up and down with their weight um, so it's never too late to try to lose weight and it's never there's never a reason not to try to do that um, what we do know about weight loss and cancer the most of the data we have right now comes from those preclinical models that I told you about and we know definitively in those models that weight loss improves breast cancer risk and relapse in response to therapy. Um, as far as the clinical, big clinical studies go, those studies take a long time. We have to have populations of people that have gained weight and not lost it versus those that have gained and lost weight and then follow them out, especially when we're talking about postmenopausal breast cancer to um, the years when they would be diagnosed. So uh, those studies are ongoing, and but based on studies that show changes in things that we know are associated with breast cancer, such as estrogen levels being high in the blood or inflammation or insulin resistance, we know that weight loss, whether it's dietary or exercise induced or even um, through surgery, like bariatric surgery, we know that weight loss improves those measures that we associate with breast cancer risk. So I expect in the coming years to start seeing some really solid studies come out um, linking weight loss to improved cancer outcomes. Okay, and this is kind of related to that. Um, does exercise play a role in reducing risk even if someone is obese? I think it does, yes, because exercise can improve. Um, so remember I showed you at the beginning, um, there was that study that said regardless of body weight, people that were considered metabolically unhealthy had a higher risk um, than those that were, that were healthy. So that study looked even at people who were considered overweight or obese and who were metabolically healthy. And their risk was lower than a, a person's who, risk who was lean but was metabolically unhealthy. And we know that exercise does a great job at improving metabolic function. So um, Always, as long as your doctor says it's okay, exercise is always a good idea. Okay, we have another question. Um, they actually want to know a little bit more about your research, um, like what receptors, proteins, etc. Um, like receptors, can you be a little bit more specific? Let I me mean, see. I can go into it, it could take a while. Like what targets am I looking at specifically? Yes. Okay, um, so I am interested in the process where fat tissue grows, and that's a normal process. It's normal for your body to, when you have excess nutrients, to grow the fat tissue to put the nutrients in there and store it for when you need nutrients and then it can let the nutrients out. But when the tissue's growing, it's gonna produce a bunch of growth factors and signaling molecules that are telling the cells to divide, that are recruiting cells to make new blood vessels so that the tissue can function normally. And that normal process that happens in, in all the fat tissues around the body is actually provides a really rich environment for a tumor that might be looking for a signal to, to grow and make new blood vessels. And so what I'm trying to do is figure out specifically what signals are produced, like what growth factors are produced by the adipose tissue um, in response to weight gain, and then how uh, those growth factors impact the tumor cells specifically. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> okay, um, and another question we got is, how do I know if I have poor metabolic function? That's a good question. Most of us, unless you're a pregnant woman, um, do not, really ever have a reason for a doctor to check your metabolic function. I mean, I've, when I was pregnant, I had a, that glucose tolerance test with that yucky, thick 
syrupy stuff. Um, but I think it's hard. I think it's really hard to know. And I think that um, it's something for women who are general, the general population. I don't know how you know unless your doctor tests you, but for women who are being treated for breast cancer, I think it's important to bring that up with your oncologist as a concern that um, you know that some of these treatments could affect your metabolism and is there something you should be doing like a um, glucose tolerance test to monitor how well your body's responding to sugar. Because you don't always feel bad when, when your metabolism is starting to go wrong. Okay, and we have uh, one more question. Do you work with a patient advocate? And if so, how has that guided your project? I do, and she's wonderful. And my advocate, actually, her name's Sabrina, um, she is the one who really started to give me the idea for this whole project from the beginning. Um, a couple years ago, I was having a coffee with her and talking about the breast cancer side of my project and the drugs I was using and how I was working on obesity. And she said, you know what, after I took tamoxifen, I felt totally different. My metabolism changed and my weight changed and I felt like really bad. And, and I started to think really. And then I looked, I started looking up papers and realized that there was a little bit of a precedent for that in the literature. And then I went back to my data and realized that I could actually ask really cool questions about how these drugs were affecting metabolism. And my, the people that I work with around me are all experts in metabolism. So, um, I wrote the grant because of her and got it funded. So she's, she's awesome. We love our advocates because that's why we yeah. do this work. Yes. Um, and one more question just came in. And um, the question is, would an A1C test um, be an, a good indicator for metabolic? Yeah, A1C, as far as I know, is a good indicator of long-term, um, long-term, what's the word? Glucose, basically, or insulin insensitivity. So yeah, if you have one of those done and it's, flags it as being high, that would be a good time to talk to your doctor about how do you know, um, how do you lower it, and how do you, what do you do to improve your metabolism? Okay, um, and another question, they're coming in, so um, <laughs> are you looking at the IGF-1 levels in patients, and um, can you talk about how certain food increases these possibly deadly levels, and what foods increase your IGF? I am not studying IGF-1. So I know somebody who does, and I can get in touch with that person and answer that question at a later time via email if that's possible. But my focus is not really on IGF-1 specifically. So I can't, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but I know who to ask. Okay, great, thank you. We'll get that answer out to you. Okay. Um, and then someone else has asked about, um, you kind of touched on this already, but you can go into more detail if you'd like, but um, if gaining weight increases your risk of breast cancer, would the inverse be true? So losing weight would decrease your risk by the same rate? I don't know about the rate specifically because the studies, these, the equivalent studies looking at gain and loss and the sort of numerical effects on cancer risk are not published, but yes, I would lowering or weight loss should lower all indications are that it should lower your risk for breast cancer and it's worth it to, you know, even if you've already gained weight, like we said, it's worth it to try to lose that weight. All right. Um, that is all the questions that I can see right now. Um, okay. So um, if you have any more questions, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A box and into the chat box. Um, I will send these to Dr. Welberg and we'll get any answers out to you over the next couple weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have any questions that come up before, uh, once this is ended, please feel free to email researchprograms at komen.org and I'll get those questions to her so that we can get them answered for you. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today and thank you, Dr. Welberg, for presenting on such a really interesting topic. Um, thank you. Thank you for having me. And thanks, everyone, for taking time to tune in. And um, we will be putting this up on our YouTube channel, and we'll be sending out a link to everybody so that um, you can view this at a later date if you would like to. So uh, thank you again, and everybody have a great day.